Vintage Sax is published by Vintage Books on the web at vintagebooks.com. Book TV is 48 hours of nonfiction books all weekend on C-SPAN 2. Coming up at noon Eastern, Noam Chomsky considers American foreign policy in his latest Hegemony or Survival. Then Daniel Pipes on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and possible solutions. Tonight on Book TV, Encore Book Notes with Hugh Price, author of Achievement Matters. After that on Public Lives, a look at Austrian economist F.A. Hayek. And at 9.15 p.m. Eastern, another chance to see MIT linguistics professor Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky critiques American foreign policy in his latest Hegemony or Survival. This talk from the United Nations Correspondents Association in New York City is an hour and 40 minutes. Okay. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for coming. I should explain, I guess, to the members of UNCA uh, that there are many people who are strangers in our midst. Uh, that's because this is a joint event with the UN Society of Writers that, in, in fact, they organized it. Um, Hans Janicek, who is the president of the UN Society of Writers, is here. Hans, thanks very much for uh, organizing this. Um, are, are the TV crews ready now? Can we get going? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, the first time I met Noam Chomsky was in 1984 in Nicaragua, um, when I used to write for the Guardian newspaper in England, uh, which, as many of you probably know, is uh, somewhat left of center. Um, and at the time, I think the analysis of the situation in Nicaragua that uh, Noam and I were doing was not very popular in the United States. Um, I think we both l subsequently felt vindicated when the International Court uh, found against the United States government at the time, and even more so when the Iran-Contra scandal blew and we found out that the Reagan administration had allowed uh, a secret government to operate from the basement of the White House in contravention of uh, statutes and contravention of law passed by Congress. At the time, um, I sort of naively thought that that was the worst violation of international law that I would ever see by an American government. Uh, but as Kofi Annan has pointed out, what we saw in Iraq last year was also a violation of international law. And it is a violation of international law by the US government that brings us back together again. And I welcome Noam here. Thanks very much for coming. Um, do you want to speak first? Or, right, no, do you want to go up to the podium there? Um, okay. Uh, Sorry, so I see some of you have your tape recorders here. I'll shunt them over. Okay. Just give me a moment to. Uh, no, he's got a wi wireless mic. I got a wireless mic. Can you hear me back there? Yeah? Okay, so the wireless is working. And these things are all presumably working. Okay, everybody settled. <laughs> National Security Association have their mic up here somewhere. Okay. Uh, well, this is, uh, strikes me while I'm here, that this is about the time of the year when my students are uh, going around for uh, job interviews, if they're lucky enough to get them. I say, this is the time of the year when my students are going around for job interviews, if they're lucky enough to be invited. Uh, and if they are, they're expected to give a talk, technical talk, uh, have a few questions. Uh, if they don't consult too many people on the faculty, they may even uh, be offered the job. And I guess that's uh, the same format. So. I'll try not to insult too many of you, and uh, <laughs> maybe I have a chance at the award. <laughs> uh, every uh, self-respecting president uh, has a doctrine uh, attached to his name. Uh, the, uh, for the current incumbent in Washington, uh, that's been expanded from uh, a doctrine to uh, visions and uh, dreams as well. 
but most presidents, it's just a doctrine. Uh, <coughs> these doctrines are interesting to investigate. They're often important. Uh, time short, I'll keep just to the current uh, Bush doctrine, which happens to be unusually prominent, uh, clearly articulated, uh, very uh, dramatically implemented, so there would be no doubt as to what it means, and uh, widely discussed to a, an unusual extent. Uh, the Bush Doctrine has several related components, all of them clearly articulated. I'll just quote uh, the first and most general uh, component of it is that it is our responsibility to history uh, to drive evil from the world. And that's a far-reaching doctrine. A uh, special case of this has got to be a relentless war on terror. Uh, and furthermore, quoting, any state that harbors terrorists is a terrorist state and will be treated accordingly uh, in, as we drive evil from the world. Uh, the third uh, and more formal enunciation of the doctrine is the national security strategy of uh, September 2002. Uh, which uh, effectively declared the right uh, to use force uh, to eliminate any perceived potential challenge uh, to U.S. global hegemony. As uh, Colin Powell put it, uh, the U.S. reserves the sovereign right to take military action where and how uh, it chooses. Uh, he happened to say that in... Uh, Davos at the World Economic Forum meeting, uh, eliciting uh, quite a negative reaction from the people who uh, the business press, the international business press, call the masters of the universe, with only a slight touch of irony. Uh, the, uh, uh, the national security doctrine uh, also uh, uh, th th at the same time, the, the Bush administration made it very clear uh, part the some of the first aspect of the implementation of it was to make it clear where they stood with regard to international law and international institutions. Uh, even before Powell's statement, uh, the government had made it clear to the United Nations uh, that it could be relevant, that was the term used, uh, if it endorsed what the U.S. was planning to do anyway, or else it could be, as Powell explained, a debating society. But those were, in effect, the choices. Be relevant and endorse what we're going to do, or you can have polite discussions somewhere. Uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm told that some people at the back can't hear you very well. Um, try do you mind using a, the, the handheld? Okay. Is this going to interfere with the other one? Is that, that better, I think? Is, it? is that yeah. better? So I undo the other one? Or? Okay. Well, this, uh, uh, this uh, announcement to the United Nations of its uh, choice between relevance and debating society uh, actually has come to the, is right on the front pages of the, new, of the press in England, not here uh, right now, in the Catherine Gunn case. Uh, as I'm sure you know, Catherine Gunn is being tried uh, because she leaked to the British press uh, reports that she had seen from the American embassy uh, calling on British intelligence to uh, illegally tap uh, members of the Security Council so that the United States would know how to coerce or pressure them into uh, becoming relevant, that is, uh, endorsing what the U.S. was going to do. Uh, those of you who know the history of the United Nations will recognize that this is coming full circle. Uh, the San Francisco Conference, uh, which established the UN, uh, at that conference, uh, delegations were also illegally tapped uh, by the FBI so that uh, the U.S. would be able to uh, control the proceedings properly. Uh, so we now have a nice uh, completion of the, of the circle. But that expresses from the beginning and dramatically today uh, the attitude towards international institutions and international law. And it's not very surprising. It's pretty much the way anyone would predict that the world dominant power would behave. Uh, it may be surprising to people who prefer illusions, uh, but uh, 
historically, it's not a great surprise. Uh, the uh, national secu uh, uh, security strategy, the formal version of the doctrine, uh, it, uh, it not only elicited uh, uh, great anger among the international uh, business elite, uh, but also among the foreign policy elite at home. So immediately after it was announced in September 2002, the major establishment journal, Foreign Affairs, a few weeks later, uh, had a published its next issue with the lead article uh, called uh, 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 de describing what the author called uh, the, the new imperial grand strategy and uh, warning that it was going to cause uh, serious problems uh, for the world and for the United States. Uh, the, uh, even before the doctrine had been officially announced, it was clear what it was going to be, uh, Henry Kissinger had uh, described the doctrine as uh, what he called a revolutionary doctrine, uh, which undermines the UN Charter, uh, undermines international law, uh, in fact, undermines the whole Westphalian system since 1648, uh, which barred uh, forceful intervention uh, into the into other sovereign states. Of course, that was Westphalia was only for great powers. You can do anything you want uh, to anyone else. Uh, it was hardly observed very magnificently, even among the great powers. But uh, this, as he, as Kissinger correctly pointed out, the new doctrine simply tears this whole framework to tatters, which he thought was a good thing. He basically supported the doctrine. Uh, but uh, like many others in the <clears throat> many other of the critics in the foreign policy elite uh, criticized the implementation said reasonable position but uh, not the way the implementation has many flaws and will call cause all sorts of dangers uh, he uh, also Kissinger is a realist scholar and he pointed out that uh, we must not permit this doctrine to be universalized it cannot become a universal principle. Uh, the, uh, in simple words, uh, this is a doctrine for the United States, uh, which it, it, the right to use force at will against perceived or potential enemies uh, is uh, to be reserved to the United States. It can delegate that right to some of its clients, uh, but uh, no one else should uh, line up uh, for the privilege. Uh, that's clear and explicit. The uh, national security doctrine was uh, immediately followed by exemplary actions to make it clear to the world that it was meant seriously. It's not just rhetoric. Uh, the most obvious of them and the one that attracted the most attention uh, was the invasion of Iraq. Uh, the, uh, uh, there were others that were to which less attention was paid but that might uh, uh, over the long term prove more significant. Uh, uh, one of them was uh, the announcement just weeks after the National Security Doctrine, the announcement by uh, the Air Force Space Command uh, of that uh, U.S. policy in accord with the National Security Doctrine was going to shift from control of space, that was the Clinton Doctrine, to ownership of space. So from now on, the U.S. would own space, not just control it. And then they went to spell out, spelled out what that difference is. Uh, it means that any potential competitor in space will be destroyed. And space means militarization of space, as they explained. Uh, and it, we have doc documents leading up to it spelling it out. It means placing... Uh, uh, space platforms for uh, highly uh, destructive offensive weapons, uh, nuclear and non-nuclear. Uh, this is under a first strike doctrine, which is official. Uh, the world will be uh, under very tight surveillance by uh, hypersonic drones, so you can tell if a, you know, somebody's walking across the street in Bangkok and so on. Uh, and it means, in principle, a command post could uh, instantaneously, without warning, attack and destroy any, any place in the world uh, uh, without much need for forward basing and other annoyances. 
uh, and this system uh, has to be owned, not just controlled. Uh, that was uh, November 19, uh, November 2002. Uh, the U.S. continued, meanwhile, to uh, oppose unilaterally uh, UN efforts to uh, ban the militarization of space. This has been going on for some years. The most recent case was last December, uh, when, uh, again, unilaterally with the reflexive votes of uh, Israel and I think uh, Micronesia, uh, the U.S. opposed the otherwise unanimous uh, uh, decision to reserve space for peaceful uses. This has been going on for some years now. UN disarmament commissions have been uh, deadlocked over uh, Washington's refusal back to Clinton uh, to uh, ban militarization of space. Uh, however, the advance from uh, control to uh, ownership is a substantial one and in line with the uh, 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 national security doctrine and very ominous in its implications. I mean, others plainly don't just say, oh, that's fine. Uh, uh, Russia has already uh, responded by sharply increasing its military spending, its offensive weaponry. Uh, it has moved to uh, launch on warning automated response systems, uh, which were dangerous enough in the past and are far more dangerous today with the deteriorating uh, command and control systems of, of, of the Russian state as the economy collapses. Uh, just to cheer you up, you may recall uh, in 1995, uh, when, before the deterioration had set in, uh, we came uh, 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 two minutes from uh, a missile launch, which probably would have destroyed much of the world. Uh, when when uh, a count, there was a 10 minute countdown uh, after uh, Russian computers had uh, misidentified a space rocket as a missile attack, it was aborted two minutes short of flight, instant retaliation, uh, presumably. Uh, go beyond what Eisenhower predicted in 19, the 1950s, that any such exchange would be mean the destruction of the Northern Hemisphere. We've gotten much more violent and powerful since then. Uh, these dangers are being enhanced. Uh, uh, Russia has also moved to a first strike doctrine. Uh, China is uh, responding the same way as predicted. Uh, what's called ballistic missile defense is understood both by adversaries and by advocates in the United States as being an offensive weapon. Uh, it's called a shield, uh, a sword, not just a shield on both sides. And the reaction to it is to build up offensive military forces, uh, uh, very threatening with the obvious ripple effects. Don't have to go into it. Uh, so these are all uh, severe challenges, threats being s significantly escalated all implementing the same thinking. Can't just attribute it to the Bush administration, uh, mentioned as roots before, but the uh, uh, a sharp escalation of it is significant, very significant. Uh, the uh, moonshot, the Chinese and American moonshots are very likely related to this. Uh, the moon is, if, if any of this gets off the ground, to use a appropriate metaphor, uh, probably the moon will be used for military purposes as part of the militarization of space system. Uh, and uh, the Chinese uh, challenge uh, to uh, land a shuttle is a challenge to the U.S. official position of ownership of space, which does not lead to uh, attractive uh, consequences if you think it through. Well, uh, let's get back to Kissinger and the justification for the revolutionary uh, new uh, doctrine and its implementation in Iraq. Uh, the, he gave the conventional justification. The justification is that Iraq possesses weapons of mass destruction and is connected to terror. Uh, well, it's by now clear uh, even from the uh, scandalous uh, Hutton report that uh, Bush and Blair and their associates uh, sexed up 
uh, the intelligence reports, uh, borrow the notorious BBC phrase, uh, which uh, elicited an interesting uh, hermeneutic uh, disquisition from uh, Lord Hutton, as you may have seen if you put yourself through the pain of reading the report. Uh, but uh, uh, that the intelligence data was sexed up is not seriously in question. And the purpose was to uh, establish that uh, uh, Iraq was a dangerous imminent threat because of its weapons of mass destruction and its uh, ties to te uh, terror. Uh, recall that that was presented as the only question, repeatedly, the only question by Colin Powell, Jack Straw, and others. Uh, and it's rather clear that they had, to, they had to know at that time that any evidence they had was shaky at best. Uh, now, we know how shaky, but what is important is what they knew then. Well, uh, the failure to find weapons of mass destruction has been significant, uh, but I think its major significance has been somewhat overlooked. Uh, the main significance of the failure to uh, find weapons of mass destruction is that the bars for aggression have been lowered. So the original doctrine was what Kissinger and the National Security Strategy stated. Uh, sta countries that have weapons of mass destruction uh, are too dangerous if they're, you know, rogue states or whatever. Well, now you have to change the doctrine, and it has been changed. So it is now just the possession or the uh, intent or ability to produce weapons of mass destruction is sufficient to justify uh, aggression, the supreme crime of Nuremberg. Uh, that's a significant change because almost everyone has the ability, uh, you know, the high school and your local community uh, probably has the ability to produce chemical and biological weapons and the intent uh, is just subjective evaluation, uh, which means that uh, anyone is uh, subject to attack. Uh, that's been made even more clear just a few days ago uh, by Condoleezza Rice, uh, who reviewed what are now the official reasons uh, for that justify the attack against Iraq, and it's worth looking at them, uh, not as a criticism of her, but to see what the conditions are that are now accepted for free aggression. According to her, Iraq, the attack on Iraq was legitimate because it had used weapons of mass destruction in the past. She omitted conventionally the words, with our support. Those are never added. Uh, secondly, it had attacked neighbors twice again omitting the fact that the first attack was with our support and the second attack uh, was followed by U.S. authorization to Saddam Hussein to crush a Shiite rebellion which might well have overthrown him, a fact which is, has an eerie similarity to what's happening right at this moment as the U.S., the CPA, is desperately evading uh, the call of Iraqis for an election uh, in which the Shiite majority would obviously dominate. Uh, so that's the uh, second uh, reason. The third reason is that uh, Saddam Hussein allowed terrorists to run in his country and was funding terrorists outside of his country. Well, she didn't bother providing evidence for that. Uh, we do have evidence, namely, that, was f that it was false. But that, it's, but that now something like that is true. So the evidence that we have, and intelligence agencies and uh, independent analysts uh, pretty much agree on this, is that before the U.S. invasion, uh, Iraq had kept quite far from the international terrorist organizations. But after the invasion, predictably, uh, Iraq itself has become a terrorist state, uh, a, uh, another front in the so-called war on terrorism, and that uh, recruitment for uh, al-Qaeda-style groups has uh, significantly increased. So as predicted, uh, the war did increase the threat of terror and indeed succeeded for the first time in turning Iraq into a, a nest of terror. 
Uh, fourth, she, the, her fourth argument is that Iraq has refused to account for its weapons of mass destruction and uh, Saddam concealed his programs. Well, that's partially true. Actually, Iraq was more closely investigated by inspectors than other countries which have anything like comparable programs. But that aside, uh, there is another country in the region uh, which uh, has refused to account for its weapons of mass destruction and concealed its programs, uh, even though it's well known that it has hundreds of nuclear weapons and is producing chemical and biological weapons uh, and is regarded uh, as extremely hazardous, in fact, by the U.S. Uh, uh, military command, uh, str um, strategic command, STRATCOM, uh, but that one doesn't count because that's a U.S. client. So it's therefore free of any of these obligations. Uh, another uh, U.S. ally, as we have, has recently been made public, though it was known for a long time, uh, Pakistan has been openly involved in uh, illegal proliferation for years. It's all been quite public, inconceivable that U.S. intelligence agencies didn't know uh, the worst of what's now being exposed was in the late 80s and the early 90s, and it's hard to imagine that the National Security Advisor at the time, uh, or the head of the Pentagon, uh, didn't know what was publicly available on the streets of uh, Islamabad, uh, meaning that the current Secretary of State and uh, Vice President had to know about this uh, right at the time, there's now a fuss being made properly because it is indeed extremely dangerous. Uh, well, those are the four reasons for uh, uh, attacking Iraq. Run through them, uh, they in effect uh, eliminate any barriers to the use of force at will. Uh, almost no pretense left. Uh, well, let me drop that and turn to the corollary, uh, the idea that states that harbor terrorists must be attacked uh, to eradicate evil. Uh, here we have to make an exception. We have to agree to exclude uh, the category of harboring government officials. Uh, if we open that door, uh, the doctrine instantly reduces to absurdity. Uh, so let's uh, not talk about harboring government officials who are large-scale terrorists and keep to harboring su what are called subnational terrorists. Uh, those who aren't at the level of pl state planners or heads of state. Uh, uh, so what about har which countries harbor subnational terrorists? Well, there are many charges about pre-invasion Iraq, the uh, kind that I've mentioned and you've heard, but they're rather dubious. And it isn't much, there's much point paying much attention to them because there are some very clear cases of harboring terrorists, therefore terrorist states, where there's just no controversy. Uh, so take, for example, a current, a case that's currently timely, uh, the case of the Cuban Five, uh, which uh, ought to be front page news everywhere. Uh, their appeal is coming up in uh, about two weeks. Uh, what are the Cuban Five? Uh, well, as I'm sure you know, uh, the United States has been engaged in large-scale terrorist attacks against Cuba since 1959. Uh, the uh, uh, U.S. government direct participation in those attacks uh, ended in the late 70s, at least officially. Uh, but sin and since that time, instead of directly attacking Cuba, uh, the United States has been harboring terrorist networks that attack Cuba. Uh, well, again, this is not uh, particularly controversial. Uh, it's accepted, for example, by the FBI and the Justice Department. Uh, so it takes a Orlando Bosch, who's now living happily in Florida. Uh, he is accused by the FBI of uh, about 30 acts of terrorism, quite serious ones, like uh, blowing up a, a Cubana airliner with uh, killing 73 people and many others, some committed on U.S. soil. Uh, the Justice Department, U.S. Justice Department, uh, regarded him, regards him as a uh, dangerous terrorist uh, whose presence in the United States is a serious threat to the United States and says that for 30 years he has been engaged in implementing or organizing terrorist activities. 
Uh, George Bush the first gave him a presidential pardon at the request of his son, the governor of Florida. Uh, so that major terrorist is now uh, uh, carefully harbored uh, in Florida. What about the Cuban Five? Where do they fit into this? Uh, in the early 90s, uh, when it was clear that terrorist attacks were going to go on from there, uh, Cuba, uh, Cuban agents uh, infiltrated uh, Florida terrorist groups uh, for several years. At one point, they, the Cuban government informed the FBI that they now had large-scale information about uh, terrorist groups operating in the United States. The FBI sent high-level officials to Havana, uh, where they were given uh, thousands of pages of documentation and uh, hundreds of hours of uh, video and audio tape uh, documenting uh, terrorist actions being planned and uh, some carried out in Florida. And the FBI did react, namely by immediately uh, uh, arresting uh, the people who gave them the information. That's the Cuban Five. Uh, they reacted by uh, leaving the terrorist cells untouched and not pursuing the information, but arresting uh, the informants who had infiltrated them and provided them with the information. Uh, three are now facing life sentences. Uh, several spent long time in, uh, this went off, whatever that is, uh, in uh, uh, solitary confinement. Uh, their wives are not allowed to visit them, no visas. Uh, the, the government insisted on trying the case in Miami. Uh, the request for a change of venue was turned down. The foreman of the jury uh, opened by uh, saying that I regard Castro as a communist dictator and other members of the jury went on. Uh, the prosecution conceded that they couldn't prove the case, uh, but a Miami uh, trial was sufficient. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the case of the Cuban Five now coming up for appeal. Uh, why uh, is uh, Cuba such a target for uh, U.S. terror? Well, actually, that was explained nicely yesterday in the lead story of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Take a look at the lead story. You see it described, it says that uh, uh, Cuba has been dedicated to the cause of derailing the U.S. agenda in Latin America and therefore is a justified target for attack. Actually, the author of the story probably didn't know it, but he was virtually quoting from uh, declassified CIA documents 40 years earlier. Uh, which explained the reason for the attack, at that time, extensive terrorist attack on Cuba, uh, on the grounds that uh, Cuba, the, the, that the very existence of the Castro regime is successful defiance of U.S. policies going back 150 years. Uh, so it just can't be meaning back to the days of the Monroe Doctrine uh, when the U.S. intended to take over Cuba. So no Russians, nothing like that. Uh, so obviously that can't be accepted, and the Wall Street Journal more or less has it straight uh, when they say that the crime is uh, uh, the d dedication to the cause of derailing the U.S.'s agenda in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, the same article of the Wall Street Journal goes on to say that uh, Chavez in Venezuela is the heir apparent to Castro's cause of derailing the U.S. agenda in Latin America, which makes... Venezuela, uh, the successful existence of that government, uh, 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 a, uh, an unacceptable successful defiance of uh, U.S. policies going back 150 years with consequences that will be familiar to people who know about the history of this region. Uh, and again, it's timely. Just a few days ago, uh, Venezuela sought extradition of two military officers who had fled Venezuela uh, after they were charged with uh, setting off bombs in Caracas. Uh, they're now here. Venezuela's asking for extradition. Uh, t two more terrorists harbored here for the moment. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, this is connected with the military coup uh, a couple months ago, which was openly backed by the Bush administration, although it drew back when uh, aroused an enormous uh, opposition in Latin America and the military coup was overthrown. 
Uh, according to the British press, uh, very good correspondence in the British press, Latin American specialists, uh, they claim to have amassed evidence that uh, the coup was instigated, or in, at least in, in part instigated, by three major figures of the Bush administration uh, who ha have uh, uh, a, a long record of involvement in terrorist crimes in the 1980s, namely Elliot Abrams, uh, Otto Reich, and John Negroponte. Uh, their involvement in terrorist crimes in the 1980s, again, isn't controversial. Uh, for that, we can turn to the World Court judgment that Tony mentioned and the uh, two Security Council resolutions uh, endorsing the World Court judgment, which, of course, were vetoed uh, by the United States, uh, with Britain politely abstaining. Uh, well, uh, just uh, to draw some conclusions, the uh, Bush doctrine quite directly uh, uh, implies that the United States is a terrorist state uh, and should be treated accordingly. It's obviously uh, harboring terrorists. I gave a few examples, can easily add many others. Just to add one more, uh, right across the river, uh, there's a leading terrorist being harbored, uh, Emmanuel Constant, who was uh, the head of uh, the paramilitary organization that was responsible for killing thousands of Haitians uh, during the, in the period of the military junta, uh, which was supported not so tacitly by Bush one and even more by Clinton. Uh, Haiti has asked for his, they've sentenced him in absentia. They've asked for his extradition repeatedly. They never get a response. Uh, the general suspicion is that the U.S. doesn't want to extradite him because in a trial, uh, connections with the, his connections with the U.S. intelligence will come out. But whatever the reasons are, he's another terrorist harbored here. One might say that uh, killing several thousand poor black people doesn't really count as much of a crime, uh, so maybe it's not like uh, other cases of harboring terrorists. Won't go into that. Well, uh, without continuing, it's, uh, it's not very hard to evaluate the uh, uh, doctrine of uh, driving evil from the world uh, if we accept the condition of universality, but as Henry Kissinger accurately pointed out, uh, that's an error. Uh, the doctrine is, uh, is, is holds only, in, uh, only uh, selectively. The power, it's a doctrine that the powerful may invoke, but not anyone else. Uh, so therefore you could say that all the examples I've given are completely irrelevant and any others like them. As for the imperial grand strategy, this, I think its implications are as revolutionary as uh, Henry Kissinger indicated. I think a good case can be made that the implications go far beyond and that it uh, should be a matter of uh, rather considerable concern. No, th thank you very much. Um, I hope we have time for a few quick questions. Um, I know Hans Janicek uh, wants to pre present you with a, a medal of excellence, but I'm, and I think there are a few qu people who want to ask some questions. Um, and. Normally, I, uh, I give myself the right to ask the first one, but today I won't hog the microphone, and uh, I'll go to Ricardo Aldai of Naughty Mex first. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Chomsky, Ricardo Aldai from Naughty Mex. I want to ask you two, two brief questions. What is, in your view, the risk of four more years of Bush, both inside the United States and for the international system, what the impact will be. And secondly, do you think uh, Kofi Annan should cede to U.S. pressure to send back human personnel to Iraq? And does he have any room not to say, I mean, to say no? Thank you. Well, no, it's very hard to predict the weather, and predicting uh, human affairs is extremely difficult. But there is a fair possibility, you know, a possibility beyond what I think any rational person would want to accept, uh, that another four years of the same policies, uh, it could be extremely dangerous for the country 
and the world uh, and could cause maybe irreparable harm. Uh, remember, we have a lot of evidence. It's not just the past four years. The same people essentially were in office for 12 years, 1981 to 1992, and there is a rich record of what they accomplished. It is not discussed in the United States because we have a kind of a principle here uh, that uh, you, you're not supposed to look into the mirror. It's not unique to the United States, but very striking here. So anything that happened in the past didn't happen, okay, uh, because we've changed course or, or some miracle has taken place. So we're therefore not permitted to carry out the rational approach that we would to anyone else. I mean, if Saddam Hussein appears in a trial and says, well, why are you bringing up all that old stuff from the 80s? It uh, doesn't mean anything now. I'm a nice guy. I just uh, had a born-again experience, and you know, I'm going right to heaven. Uh, we wouldn't even bother laughing. But when that is done year after year after year, as it is, by our own leaders, we applaud. Okay, that's what it means to be a disciplined intellectual. Uh, and if we don't want to accept that discipline, we can treat the matter just as we would in the case of Saddam's crimes or Stalin's crimes or anyone else's. We can ask, well, what did they do during those 12 years and what have they been doing the last four years, the more reactionary? It's a reactionary selection from the first 12 years, and it's clear enough. They have a domestic agenda, which is not hidden. I mean, they're trying to unravel the uh, progressive legislation of the past century to uh, uh, overcome the achievements of popular struggles, hard ones, uh, to gain some benefits for people, what we call a minimal welfare state, uh, to transfer power into the hands of uh, unaccountable private tyrannies in one way or another. Every aspect of the uh, program is like that. Internationally, uh, they have the programs that I've described. Uh, they may back off from them because they may find them unfeasible, uh, but the programs are clear, and uh, that's only part of them. I mean, there's also <coughs> programs about international economic arrangements. I think these could be very dangerous. In fact, the kinds of programs I just talked about could literally uh, lead to destruction of the species. You know, again, you can't put a probability on that. We don't know what the likelihood was of... Uh, uh, a devastating nuclear war in 1962, right? When literally the world was one word away from a nuclear exchange. One Russian submarine commander countermanded an, uh, uh, an order to uh, shoot off uh, nuclear tipped torpedoes during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which very likely would have led to a devastating uh, nuclear response and then on and on, and uh, then uh, Eisenhower's destruction of the Northern Hemisphere. One word. That was 1962. Uh, January 1959, 1995 was much more dangerous, far greater destructive capacity. At that point, we were two minutes away. Uh, as uh, these threats are being increased, militarization of space alone is increasing the threat significantly. Uh, and. Uh, you know, rational people don't take chances like that, and no matter what your subjective probability is, but it will increase. Financial Times. Oh. Well, you know, basically no one has a right to be in Iraq but Iraqis, so they should take the lead in determining what happens. Uh, what the invasion has left such wreckage that... Uh, how Iraqis might decide to deal with what remains, you know, I can't say. I mean, we know what they say in polls, and you can make your own judgments from that. Uh, in recent Iraqi polls, the, uh, the most favorable uh, rating for a uh, foreign leader is Jacques Chirac. Uh, the, uh, by, literally, <laughs> by, uh, by about f five to one, they regard the U.S. British forces occupiers, not liberators. Uh, right after Bush made his speech about uh, how we're changing course once again and going to bring democracy to the world, 
actually reiterating what Reagan had said 20 years earlier and everyone else, uh, after that speech, which was greeted with the usual reverential awe in the United States, uh, there was a poll in Iraq about asking you know, Iraqis why they thought uh, the U.S. was in Iraq, and some agreed with President Bush and the commentators here, uh, one percent. One percent thought that the goal was to bring democracy to Iraq. About 70 percent thought it was to control Iraq's uh, resources and to reorder the Middle East and consistently with the goals of uh, the United States and Israel. Uh, actually, their responses were more nuanced and sophisticated. When it went further, it turned out that about half, although 1% thought the U.S. was trying to bring democracy, about half thought that the United States wanted democracy if the U.S. could control it. Now that's the sophisticated response, the one that's based on history, the one that is understood by everyone in Latin America, for example, or the one that Iraqis understand perfectly well from their own history. I'm sorry, they were free, you know, under British rule since the 1920s. Uh, but they know, without reading British uh, secret records, uh, that they were granted freedom uh, on the grounds, the internal British records, that they would be an Arab facade uh, behind which Britain would rule uh, with various constitutional fictions and so on, and uh, same in Central America and the Caribbean. Yes, you can be free and democratic as long as you do what we say. You know. And I presume that's the reaction of Iraqis, and usually the victims have a reasonably good understanding of the world. Uh, the people holding the hammers and guns usually don't understand very well. Uh, but. I think we should try to respond to their understanding. And if they want uh, uh, UN officials there, a, a, a UN force, they're okay. I mean, if they want a, a military forces from the region to try to control the miserable security situation that's resulted from the invasion, okay, that's their decision. Uh, if they uh, want to accept the uh, economic program that has been rammed down their throats by the CPA, which no sovereign country would accept, just opening the country up to complete uh, purchase by foreigners, meaning mainly U.S. corporations. If they decide they want that, like they want to commit economic suicide, all right, fine. Uh, if they decide they want the kinds of uh, uh, social and economic programs that every sovereign state with any independence pursues, that's fine too, then we throw that out, uh, Actually, and so uh, on down the Ahmad Chalabi was in this room not so long ago and he told us he loved the program. Yeah, he may. I mean, that program will have, we know what, the, that effect, what effect such programs have. Those are the programs that created the third world. I mean, if anyone who knows any economic history knows that, you know, say, 200 years ago, there wasn't much difference between what's now the first world and what's now the third world. Actually, India and China were the commercial and industrial centers of the world. Europe was kind of backwards in most respects. But uh, now they're very different, hugely different. How did it happen? Uh, the European states, the developed states, England, United States, France, Germany, uh, Japan, the one country that resisted colonialism, uh, up to the East Asian you know, tigers, without exception, they radically violated uh, the principles of economic liberalism. They insisted on massive state protection and subsidy, just as the U.S. economy does today. Uh, it, uh, uh, they, they were very highly protectionist uh, uh, and interventionist. On the other hand, they forced what is now the third world to accept economic liberalism, a good program that Chalabi wants. Uh, an extreme form of it. And it had the predicted effects. So at the end of 200 years of British rule, uh, India was not the commercial industrial center of the world anymore from which Britain was stealing technology and so on. It was an impoverished uh, peasant country with uh, mortality rates about the same as they'd been 200 years earlier. It began to develop afterwards when it could follow its own principles. However, in every one of these third world countries, every one, there is an elite which is extremely wealthy and privileged, uh, serves the interests of the foreign masters, and they do just fine. You know, you go to the poorest country in sub-Saharan Africa and there are people living at a lavish lifestyle we can't dream of. So in Iraq too, under this system, there will be such people. 
some of the ones working with the foreign uh, bankers and uh, international investors and uh, with Halliburton and so on. They're going to have local managers. No, and we're fast running out of time. There are various people who want to ask questions. Um, I see three hands that I can identify. I think there are more back there. I'd like to take three questions and then um, I think what I should do is allow those who want to leave to leave. Um, so I'm going to recognize the Financial Times, the Iranian news agency in Tempo, and any others who want to ask any questions, I'll ask you to pause. We'll have uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the medal ceremony. Those who want to leave can leave, and those who want to stay and ask any more questions, if you, if you can uh, bear to do it, then uh, we'll let you do that. The other thing is perhaps I could ask you to be a tad briefer in your responses. Yeah. Never hear that. <laughs> Financial time. Um, actually, I was going to ask two questions, but I'm just going to ask one now. Very specific question. I was very interested in the stuff you're saying about space. Um, do you have a sense of where the debate is going now in the United Nations in terms of? I, I, it's just something I haven't followed and almost didn't hit our radar screen. Or, and what's going to be coming up over the next year? Thanks. Well, we can. That's a very easy one to answer. Just take a look at the the, the last debate was December at the General Assembly. It's the first committee, I guess, the Committee on Space and Disarmament, which is essentially the full General Assembly. It was last December. There were several resolutions that came to the fore. Uh, one was a reiteration of the uh, uh, effort to ban militarization of space. I don't remember the numbers, but I think it was voted something like you know 174 to 3 or something like that, uh, US, Israel, and some Pacific. Pacific Island. Uh, there was another important resolution uh, which called for uh, uh, removing uh, weapons of mass destruction from the Middle East. And that was also voted overwhelmingly. I, again, I don't remember the numbers, but overwhelmingly with the US, uh, Israel, and maybe a Pacific Island opposed. Uh, but you can look at the debates. They're right there on the, you know, on the UN record. And that's been going on for years. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the first committee, the, the Disarmament uh, and Security Committee, I think it's called, uh, has, been dealing, has been meeting regularly for, I don't know, six or seven years, uh, try, and, and has been hung up on the question of militarization of space. Uh, everyone on the committee, is led part by China, but it's been essentially unanimous, uh, has been trying to put some teeth in the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which does loosely reserve space for peaceful uses. And they want to enforce that and strengthen it. Uh, and it's been blocked all the way by the United States, all the way. Uh, and there is no reporting on this in the United States, actually, virtually none. I had some friends do database searches. You know, you find a little newspaper in Utah that mentioned it or something. Uh, so it's basically unknown, uh, but it's public. Is anything coming up? Is there anything new? New coming up? Yeah, the disarmament committee will continue to meet, and the general assembly they'll continue to meet, but they can't do anything if the United States vetoes it. I mean, the same is true on the Outer Space Treaty itself. There is a 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which is not terribly specific, but the implication of it is, is to prevent the use of space for military purposes. For a long time, nobody did much with it. A few years ago, efforts started coming along in the General Assembly to ratify it again, re-ratify it. The reason was the recognition that the U.S. intends to violate it. And it's come up year after year, I forget how many now. Uh, that one, the U.S. doesn't vote against, it abstains. Everyone votes for it, and the U.S. and Israel abstain. Okay, Israel doesn't matter, but uh, a, a U.S. abstention is, in effect, a veto, okay. a double veto. A U.S. abstention vetoes the proposal and vetoes it from history, which is why you don't know about it. Uh, so it's not reported and not discussed and so on. So the double veto has succeeded in uh, blocking efforts to, so I said, abstain. But when the U.S. abstains, it's, in effect, a veto. It's because that means it's not going to happen, okay? When the most powerful state in the world says, I'm not going to have anything to do with this, that's an effective veto, and in fact, a double veto, uh, because the reporting is also effectively vetoed, and it disappears from history. Uh, the, uh, 
and, and that's been the course of the uh, uh, issue of militarization of space for um, probably five or six years. And this goes back to the Clinton administration. Uh, all of this is completely public, incidentally. So if you read the, uh, if you look, take a look at the website of the Space Command, that's open. Uh, back around 1997, uh, it's a Clinton era, era, the Space Command announced clearly its programs for then control of space, not ownership of space. Now it's up to ownership uh, for control of space. Uh, very elusively, I mean, like kind of reading like a little Maoist red book, it said the U.S. must uh, uh, control, have military control of space to protect our uh, investments and commercial interests. Okay, and then it went on to give a little bit of history. It said uh, in the past, uh, countries needed armies and navies like Britain to control their uh, commercial interests and investments. And now the next frontier is space, and we're going to take control of that uh, to control our commercial interests and investments. Okay? They're very frank. You know. uh, they, they also pointed out, uh, here they agree with U.S. intelligence projections, that uh, the process of so-called globalization will have exactly the opposite effects of what is predicted. Namely, it will increase... Uh, the, it will lead to a widening economic divide, a growing gap between the haves and the have-nots. The U.S. intelligence projections are the same. It'll lead to a growing economic divide, uh, also financial volatility, meaning lower growth. Uh, uh, and in this case of, uh, in situation with a growing, with a widening economic divide and a growing number of have-nots, it's going to be harder to keep them under control. Uh, so therefore, we knew, knew devices like, for example, militarization of space. Iranian news agency. Uh, professor, what would be the role and situation of other players, uh, le such leaders of Russia, China, France, and others? Will they have to give up uh, uh, to some kind of compromise or what? Nobody has to do anything. Uh, what they are likely to do is pretty much what they are doing. Uh, Russia, as I mentioned, has, in the last year, has sharply increased, I think by about 30 percent, its military spending for offensive military purposes, new offensive weapons, uh, and so on. Uh, China is widely expected to do the same, or maybe already be doing the same, uh, in, in part in just in reaction to um, uh, ballistic missile defense development. I mean, everyone involved in that has predicted that, of course, China is going to respond uh, by uh, increasing its offensive military capacities. Uh, others will respond uh, in other ways. I mean, nobody is going to say, thank you, uh, please cut my throat. Uh, if you announce that you're going to attack people at will and destroy them at will, they are likely to find some mode of response. Uh, that's why many uh, international well-known international scholars have said that these policies increase or tend to increase proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and to increase terror. Those are reactions that people can use. And sooner or later, uh, weapons of mass destruction and terror will come together, maybe right here. It's just a matter of time. Uh, so those are possible reactions. Uh, there are other things going on as well. I mean, militarily, the world is unipolar. No question about that. I mean, the U.S. probably spends as much as the rest of the world combined or close to it in military force, and it's far more advanced. For example, there isn't a space race now because there's only one country racing. When the U.S. is talking about going from contro control to ownership, it's not as if someone else is interfering with the control. They're not. So overwhelmingly ahead from a military point of view, but not economically. Uh, economically, there are have been and are three major uh, economic centers, more or less on a par. Uh, Euro Europe, uh, Northeast Asia, Japan, China, South Korea, uh, others interacting with them. They're kind of on a par. Uh, Europe is an economic uh, unit of the same category as the United States. Uh, Northeast Asia is the most dynamic uh, economic region of the world. Uh, it's, uh, it also happens to have about half of global 
foreign exchange reserves. The former head of uh, Clinton's Council on Economic Advisors, Laura Tyson, really de recently described the international economy in four simple words. She said, America spends, Asia lends. And how long that's going to go on, nobody knows. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it, uh, it's, it's an area which has reserves, which is growing fast, uh, which already has a greater GDP than North America does. Uh, Europe is the same. Europe, contrary to a lot of talk, has approximately the same growth level, uh, productivity growth level per capita as the United States, uh, and uh, can go off in its own direction. Uh, these are issues that go way back to the end of the Second World War. I mean, th right throughout the Cold War, one of the concerns of U.S. planners was that Europe would become what was called a third force. It would go off on its own. Well, that still remains. The end of the Cold War hadn't changed that. And now there are uh, comparable uh, problems in East Asia. A lot of the maneuvering around control over Middle East oil and the lesser but significant Central Central Asian oil resources, a lot of that maneuvering, uh, including Iran, has to do with uh, who's going to control those energy resources. Because whoever controls them, if the U.S. controls them as it intends to do, uh, it will have uh, what George Kennan once called veto power uh, over the decisions of other actors. That was 50 years ago. It's even more the case now. So a lot of, a lot of alternatives. Tiempo. Eh, Tiempo Madrid. Eh, Professor Chomsky, eh, considering the different perceptions that are in America and in Europe, for example, or with the rest of the world, uh, on the war in Iraq, on the Middle East, on the, even on the role of the United Nations, what do you think that is the role that the American media plays in forging public opinion and public policy? Mm. Um, fine. I mean, there's a lot of study of this. By and large, the media transmit a doctrinal position which is shared uh, by state power, by corporate power, and by uh, the media elites themselves who are part of it. Uh, it's easy to document it. If, if, you want a, an, an, a, uh, if you want a close analysis concerning with, concerned with Iraq, I'd suggest that you take a look at one careful study done by, uh, which you can pick up on the web, done by uh, the most important uh, public attitude study uh, program in the world. It's the program on international policy attitudes of, uh, at the University of Maryland, pipa.org. You can pick it up. Uh, they did a study about a month ago or so called Misimpressions of Iraq, okay, in which they investigated beliefs that are so obviously outlandish that there's no serious debate about whether they're true or false. Uh, and those are the misimpressions of Iraq. And they uh, uh, evaluated them among the public. They're extremely high. But then, in response to your question, they traced those uh, misimpressions to media sources. Okay. Turned out if you're getting, people who are getting their news from Fox News, uh, about 80 percent had at least one serious misimpression many more. Uh, people who were getting their Im news from major print media, you know, elite print press, about 50 percent serious misimpression. Uh, those who were getting it from national public radio, about 25 percent serious misimpression. These incidentally are misimpressions that I don't think anyone would have in Europe or Asia or anywhere else. Uh, and that's a misleading estimate, as they point out, because about 20 to 25 percent of the public, somewhere in that neighborhood, are getting their information from talk radio. Uh, you just turn that on, and you'll find out what that means. And among young people, when you sort of break down the demographics, uh, I've forgotten the numbers, but I think a majority from, say, 18 to 22, roughly that range, are getting their news from uh, comic shows that are on television late at night, you know, these political comic shows. Well, you know, we're taking out that piece of the population, but uh, I, this is an indication of the way uh, a 
effectively the corporate media transmit a kind of propaganda line, not because they are subordinating themselves to it, but because they agree with it. Professor Chomsky, we uh, clearly could uh, go on all afternoon here. There are a lot of people I could see who would like to ask questions, but we don't have time. And Hans Janicek does want to give you your medal for your <laughs> sterling work over the years. Um, I'm going to allow my colleagues who, who need to go off and file uh, to leave. Um, and we'll go to the medal ceremony. And then those who want to stay and ask some questions, perhaps we might be able to squeeze in a few before lunch. Hans. Professor Chomsky, it's a great honor for us that you accepted our invitation, but even more so that you accepted our award of excellence, which um, the Society of Writers has been giving annually to outstanding literary and political figures for their contribution to peace and understanding. In fact, over the past, 15 or 17 years so far, and it was previously awarded to international statesmen such as Mikhail S. Gorbachev and great writers like Norman Mailer. The members of the society, founded in 1989, are diplomats and journalists accredited to the United Nations as well as individual staff members with a distinguished literary record. We deeply believe that there is a link between uh, politics or diplomacy on one hand and literary art on the other. Because there are many things that you cannot say in a political or diplomatic fashion. You need a literary element. And uh, this is one of the things that we have admired about you for so many years. It's not only what you say. It's how you say it. And you can see what a response you have. And you never raise your voice. And you never swear. And you never hit the table with your fist. You always keep calm, but persuasive. Pers persuasive indeed. And this is why the citation for the award, which is a medal, I will, I will show it, which is a medal on a blue ribbon with the inscription Ex Mente Orbis, uh, which I would uh, uh, translate as from the spirit of the world. But there are also other interpretations, but what it means really is the conscience of mankind, and that's what it's all about. Professor Chomsky, we honor you today in gratitude. You have kept the flame of reason and common sense alive when they were threatened. You stayed calm in the clash of civilizations, but recorded the conflict in a uniquely somber and persuasive style. Your voice is heard all over the globe. You have earned the respect of millions, eager to find the truth in a troubled world. There is no better place to express our respect to you than here at the United Nations, whose spirit and principles you represent. appreciate it, and uh, now I know how my students feel when they get offered the job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're, I'm, we're going to be taking the professor upstairs to have some lunch shortly, but uh, are there any more questions? Does anybody? Well, I only Beautiful. see 
I only see, I see three hands, so I'm going to take those three questions and then um, I'm afraid that's going to be it. Anjali, the, uh, the pioneer of India. Thank you. Uh, yesterday, uh, George Bush, he announced his budget, and there's an increase in defense spending. How alarming is that? Can you comment? Mm -hmm. how, how alarming is the increasing defense spending? Uh, well, I mean, it's alarming in many respects. For one thing, spending on one uh, area uh, provides what are called foregone opportunities. It means you don't spend on another. There are very serious problems in the country that require uh, major spending. I don't have to enumerate them. And there, uh, if you have more spending for what's euphemistically called defense, uh, you don't spend on those other things. So those problems get worse, and they are serious. Uh, the military spending itself uh, has two functions. Uh, one function is, uh, of course, uh, intimidation and domination. It's what's described in, uh, say, the Clinton era, era Space Command uh, uh, document, the public document brochure that I quoted, uh, to uh, use military force to secure uh, U.S. investments and commercial interests. Uh, and now that means in accord with the national security strategy uh, as by now uh, sharpened uh, according to the right to uh, attack anyone you like uh, without, you know, without uh, pretext and in accord with the means now available with ownership of space and so on. So that's one aspect and we don't have to talk about what that implies. It's not pretty. However, there's another aspect to military spending which is often uh, suppressed. It keeps the economy alive. Now, this is not what's called the military-industrial uh, complex. That's wrong. Uh, what's called the new economy, you know, that everyone is so proud of, what Alan Greenspan hails as the result of uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of the free market, and you've heard all of this stuff. Uh, almost all of that comes out of the dynamic state sector of the economy. Uh, that's one reason why uh, the third world became the third world, uh, while the first world remained, became the first world. The first world relies on a dynamic state sector, no country more than the United States. So take a look at all the things you're, you use, you know, computers, uh, electronics generally, uh, the internet, uh, uh, trade, which is based on containerization, containers, uh, biotechnology, uh, you know, run through the list. Uh, they almost all derive from the state sector. The public, th there are devices by which the public pays the costs and shares the risk. And then if anything comes out of it, it's handed over to private power. So like say the internet. Uh, it was for 30 years it was in the state sector. That's when all the hard work was done. Around 1995, it was marketable, so it was handed over to private corporations. Uh, computers. Throughout the, 1950, uh, in the 1950s, a computer was something about the size of this room with uh, vacuum tubes blowing up all over the place and paper f flooding all over. Uh, during the 1950s, under the pretext of air defense, uh, the uh, uh, places like MIT, where I am, uh, were able to get the computers down to the point where you could sell them to somebody. The first mainframes company was a spin-off from that around 1960. That's why IBM has shifted from making typewriters to making computers. They were part of this. And it's the same with almost the entire dynamic part of the economy. Furthermore, this goes way back in history. Uh, so the, uh, uh, if you go back a century, uh, the major engineering problems, metallurgical and engineering problems and mechanical problems, the major ones, the hard ones, uh, had to do with uh, putting huge guns 
on moving platforms, which were able to hit another moving target, meaning naval guns. That was an extremely difficult problem. It required complicated engineering, electronics, metallurgy, and so on. And it was carried out primarily by the English and the Germans then uh, uh, under the rubric of defense. Uh, but then, of course, it spun off into the automotive industry and all sorts of other things, and it gave the economy of that day. Uh, economic historians of technology point out, maybe accurately, that uh, space, that the problems of space today are comparable to the problems of naval gunnery a gun, uh, hundred, hundred years ago, and it'll have the same effect. Uh, so that's, with, without proceeding, that's another part of the defense, so-called defense system. It's a way of socializing risk and cost and creating the profits of the future economy. Uh, everyone, you know, it, it, I mean, this is all kind of suppressed in a way. And so we talk about free markets and the entrepreneurial spirit and uh, everything else, but the actual way the economy works is crucially like this. And that's part of the military system too. And you could ask, is it a good thing? You know, is it nice to have computers and the internet and so on? Well, maybe, maybe not. But the real question is, uh, is that the way to do it? I mean, should the decision to spend public funds uh, to develop computers rather than, say, a health system, should that be made by deceiving people uh, into believing they're being protected from enemies? Or should it be made by the people themselves who are evaluating these decisions? In other words, do we believe in democracy? If we believe in democracy, back in the 1950s, uh, there wouldn't have been uh, you know, an air defense system uh, designed to create computers that IBM could later sell. Uh, there would have been a public informed discussion of whether we want our resources to go into uh, having PCs 25 years from now or have a decent uh, health care and school and transportation system. I mean, I know which way I would have voted, but it's for people to decide. And the, those decisions are taken out of people's hands, in large part through the military system. It's another one of the devices for undermining democracy and for creating a particular kind of private-run economy in the future. That's quite apart from its role in the um, use of military force. So all of this has to be considered. Le Monde. I was just wondering, would you have any comment on the presidential race so far? On the presidential race? Well, you know, it's not a great secret that uh, in the United States, uh, elections are basically bought. A uh, large part of the population accepts that as true. So right before the 2000 election, before the election, so no Florida trickery, you know, no Supreme Court, uh, before the election, uh, about three-quarters of the public uh, regarded it as mostly a farce, uh, uh, some game involving rich contributors, uh, party bosses, and the public relations industry, huge public relations industry, uh, which trains candidates uh, to keep away from issues, uh, to pre uh, present what are called qualities, you know, I'm a nice guy. Uh, to, and to talk about values, but to keep away from the issues that are important to people. Uh, and, if you, and even if they talk about those issues, to do it in such a way that nobody can figure out where they stand, okay, which was essentially the case. Uh, that's the attitude of about 75% of the public. And uh, it's not inaccurate. And the result is that whoever can flood the, uh, you know, can flood the propaganda system overwhelmingly tends to win. You look at the statistics over the years, it's dramatic. Now, in a democratic culture, that concentration of power could be overcome. So, to say, take Brazil, a recent case. I mean, in Brazil, concentration of capital, concentration of media is worse than it is here. Uh, it's a much more repressive state than here. Here, the state is minimally repressive by comparative standards. Uh, nevertheless, uh, popular organizations were able to reach a level of um, activism, um, engagement, in which they were able to overcome these consequences. In the United States right now, that's just not imaginable. It should be, but it isn't. Uh, in order to reach the level of, say, Brazil, 
uh, we would have to have a uh, reconstruction, revitalization of a democratic culture that has been very severely eroded, consciously eroded. I mean, it doesn't just happen by itself. Uh, and that's a hard work. It's not going to happen by this election. So this election will be like the standard one, I presume, in which uh, uh, it'll be bought. Who's going to buy it? Well, you know, the, the Bush administration has money coming out of their ears. Uh, the financial industry loves them. The pharmaceutical industry is, you know, just uh, salivating over the wonderful gifts they're getting. Uh, the rich in general are getting enormous gifts from the administration, and they're going to pay it back uh, uh, because they want they want this uh, train ride to continue. It's fantastic for the extreme rich and wealthy, the financial institutions, uh, um, you know, other top sectors of the economy, they love it. So they want it to stay, and that means in the last, uh, no matter what Democrat is nominated, uh, in the last couple of weeks of the election campaign, you can expect a huge PR campaign. I mean, we can guess. Here, here's one guess as to what it'll be. I mean, just pulling it out of a hat. I mean, if I was Karl Rove, you know, say, planning what's going to happen in the last couple of months, I'd say, well, you know, here's a nice uh, scenario. Uh, let's, uh, right before the Democratic Convention, let's either kill or capture Osama bin Laden. Uh, almost certain they know where he is. You know, how, how hard can it be to find somebody in a small area of Afghanistan or uh, Pakistan? So let's wait until right before the Democratic Convention, suddenly kill or capture Saddam, um, Osama. Huge victory in the war on terror. Uh, Let's, if, say, Kerry runs, let's uh, paste this achievement alongside of a picture of him standing next to Jane Fonda and stabbing our brave boys in the back. Uh, and, uh, you know, on and on. Then on to the coronation right here in New York uh, by accident, uh, timed with the anniversary of 9-11. I don't have to tell you what that's going to look like. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't have to be a... PR genius to figure out how to do this. So something like that will presumably happen. And unless there's some very surprising changes, I, it's very hard for me to see how it can fail. I, ho I hope it fails, but... Um, I, you know, I had said I'd just take one more, but I'll... I'll uh, how can I turn down a request like that? So, uh, uh, I, could you identify yourself? I don't know Greek you. Greek newspaper, Elefraudibia. Which? Uh, could you repeat that? Greek newspaper, Elefraudibia. Greek. 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 Uh, professor, many people claim that uh, the Republican Party has become the official party of the religious right. What are the consequences of this in the following year? And the second part is why the anti-war movement in the USA was not successful in stopping, in stopping the war in Iraq? Why couldn't they persuade the public opinion again? Well, on, on the first question, uh, yeah, there's no doubt that, uh, I mean, the Republican Party is basically a, a party of the super rich, uh, and they have to have a popular base. And one way in which they've organized a popular base is uh, uh, what are called uh, in the PR industry values. Keep away from issues and focus on values. In other words, don't let people think about the fact uh, that uh, uh, they're not going to have a job. That don't, don't let them think about the fact that in the 20 years since the Republicans basically took over with a little interim, um, average real wealth has actually declined for about 90% of the population. Don't let them think about that. Don't let them think about the fact that Americans have the uh, highest workload in the world, uh, uh, the lowest benefits, uh, uh, the least social, you know, that uh, the only country with basically no advanced country with no health services, uh, the, you, you can't take care of your elderly mother. I mean, don't let people think about that sort of thing. Let them think about uh, uh, rising to heaven uh, when... Uh, uh, all the evil has been destroyed and the souls are saved, okay? Or let them think about having a lot of guns that they can run around with and kill all the aliens who are going to attack them or something like that. Let them think about those things, but keep away from the issues, okay? Don't let them deal, don't deal with the fact that they really oppose these, these 
a corporate run globalization systems. Everybody opposes them, so let's not talk about them. Uh, and in fact, let's just keep away from all the issues and focus on values. So yeah, you get a, a mobilization of uh, uh, the uh, extremist fundamentalist group, which is big in the United States. This is, I mean, this goes back to the or, its origins. It's not new. I mean, it goes back to the origins of the country, this extreme fundamentalist strain. I mean, the people who uh, conquered New England, you know, early the pilgrims, I mean, they were raving fundamentalist lunatics, you know, who were uh, you know, waving the holy book and declaring themselves the children of Israel and exterminating the Amalekites and, you know, the whole story. I mean, all kind of, and it's for various reasons it stayed like that. It didn't become a major political phenomenon until Carter. Carter, who I presume was sincere, uh, presented himself as a pious Christian. And that uh, it was clearly understood pretty well that that's an electoral gambit that we can use. Since that time, just about every candidate for president, almost every one, pretends to be a very religious, uh, uh, you know, Christian. I mean, you know, like Bill Clinton made sure that every Monday morning there'd be a photograph in the newspaper about him lustily singing prayers at the Baptist so-and-so. Uh, what's going on in his mind is anybody's circumstance question. But this is just a, a, a precondition for entering the political system ever since this was discovered. And it's a way of keeping people away from the issues. Uh, just like, in fact, if you take a look at the last election, the year 2000, uh, Bush managed to get a roughly 50-50 split by getting uh, a, a large white working class vote. And where the two main issues were not my job or the trade issues I hate or that kind of stuff. The two main issues were religiosity and guns. Okay, that's running a successful campaign. Keep entirely away from the issues that bother people and just uh, go to something you can throw them red meat on. So yeah, that's a connection that's real. Uh, there was a second part. Uh, about the anti -war movement. Oh, the anti-war movement? Well, I think it's a funny question to ask. I mean, it's like asking why in uh, 1962 uh, didn't the anti-war movement succeed in uh, stopping the U.S. attack against South Vietnam? Well, one reason is there wasn't any anti-war movement. Okay. Uh, why didn't the uh, anti-war movement in France in 1950 prevent France from reinvading their former colony? Same answer, there wasn't any anti-war movement. I mean, by now, uh, opposition to war has reached far greater proportions. By now, you can have massive anti-war movements even before a war is officially declared. So, so it's true, it you know, didn't quite succeed in stopping it, but that's an enormous change over earlier years. I mean, in the case of Vietnam, for example, it was seven or eight years uh, before there was any visible anti-war movement. By then, South Vietnam was virtually destroyed. In the case of the French conquest of Vietnam, nothing, you know, destroyed. No, no, yeah, a couple of people protested, but no movement. Uh, and uh, those are changes over the years. Uh, when the Belgians, uh, you know, got rid of uh, Lumumba and took over the Congo, did you see any protests? No, it's, it's become a much more civilized world since then. So, yeah, we should be thankful for that. There's never been anything like the protests last February. Never, here or anywhere else. Is it enough to stop uh, another act of aggression? Well, maybe not, but it's certainly a lot better than ever was. So could you identify yourself? Yeah. <coughs> My name is uh, Chike Moma. I'm a retired uh, librarian from the United Nations. 1990, I retired. I do not represent any newspaper. I have a question that, um, to which there might not be an easy answer. The Berlin Conference of 1886 imposed boundaries on African countries and with which we have had to live for 100 and what? 20, 30 years. 
Do you think that the United Nations should take the lead in freeing Africa from the burden of these imposed boundaries that have no logic whatsoever in considerations of the ethnicities involved. Um, the prime example is Nigeria, of course, from which I come, where we have struggled with, we've struggled endlessly with the ethnicities, the diversities, which diversity is good in America. Diversity in Nigeria has given us a lot of trouble. Is it reasonable for the world to lift this burden from off the African sh uh, shoulders so that peoples that cannot live together can peacefully be helped to separate if they, are, if they have the potential for viability. In the intervening years, Czechoslovakia, little Czech Czechoslovakia is peacefully split into two. Things are going on in Yugoslavia, in the Soviet Union, where people have separate, peoples have separated, not always peacefully, but uh, I know in Nigeria, Biafra tried to separate and was crushed. So my question simply is, should there not be an end to the burden of the Berlin Conference of 1886? Thank you. I actually think that's a subcase of a much broader question. Uh, for, first, the narrow question, should the world overcome this problem for Africa, the, say the UN? I don't think so. I think those are problems that have to be overcome in Africa. I think Africans should overcome that problem in their way with whatever support and sympathetic support the rest of the world can give them. However, these problems, as you say, are not unique to Africa. Uh, these, this is the development of the modern nation-state system in the last hundreds of years. I mean, Europe, which is the center of it, uh, was the bloodiest and most savage part of the world for hundreds of years because Europeans were slaughtering each other, uh, trying to establish a totally insane system, namely the nation-state system which exactly as you say, just in Europe, doesn't correspond to what, people, what people's cultures are, what their connections are, what their languages are, whatever. It's just some irrational system of force and domination that is imposed on people with tremendous violence. I mean, that's how Europe developed the kind of culture of violence which allowed it to conquer the world. They were very practiced at slaughtering each other. Like the Thirty Years' War alone, you know, that led to the Treaty of Westphalia, probably killed about maybe 40% of the population of Germany. These, these were not little things. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, it, gone, it would still, still be going on. Uh, there's a lot of talk in political science about democratic peace. You know, democratic countries don't go to war. Well, you can look at the statistics, but there's one fundamental reason why you're getting any results at all. Uh, in 1945, Europeans, you know, the democratic countries, realized that the next time they play their traditional game of slaughtering each other will be the last because they had constructed uh, means of destruction so fantastic that this game is just over. Okay, did it for the last 500 years. We can't do it anymore. So we're not going to fight each other anymore. We'll fight defenseless people, but not each other, you know, because you know, otherwise it's over. We can't do it. Uh, so yes, there's a kind of a democratic peace. Does that mean that for Europe this is the right system? No, it's a highly artificial system in Europe too. Uh, that's why you see in Europe, uh, in opposition to the centralizing tendencies of the European Union, there are also uh, regional tendencies developing. So if you look at Spain and uh, England and other parts of Europe, there's a kind of devolution going on. Uh, into re regions that are more autonomous, that are reviving independent local cultures and languages. Uh, and I think that's a much, that's a very healthy development in my view. And not just for, and this, uh, in, in the rest of the world, most of the conflicts that are going on, not just Africa, Asia, the Middle East, everywhere else, are the results of Europe's forceful imposition of the state system. Okay. 
in a way which had nothing to do with the people. I mean, take your, what's Iraq? Yeah. Iraq was created by the British uh, in order to ensure that they would have the oil, not Turkey, and that the country wouldn't have an access to the sea so they could control it, okay, and make it free and democratic, you know. Uh, and, and that's the same everywhere you look. I mean, uh, you know, actually, personal remark, I happen to be under investigation by the state security courts in uh, Turkey because of a talk that I gave in Diyarbakir, Southeast Turkey, in which I said something nice about the Ottoman Empire. You know, I, I didn't suggest that we should go back to the Ottoman Empire, you know, a lot of rotten things about it. But I did say I thought in many respects the Ottoman Empire had the right idea. Uh, it, it, there was a center, which fortunately was very corrupt, so it didn't interfere with people too much. Uh, but for the most part, it left people alone to run their own affairs. So, you know, an, an Armenian part of, uh, you know, Lebanon could run its affairs, and somebody else could run something else. And you could travel from one place to another without having a visa, you know. And the local regions were pretty much autonomous and federated and related and so on and so forth. And that's a pretty sensible way for the world to be organized, I think. But that means unraveling a, uh, a, a, a complex system of nation states now very tightly linked to private power because they're called multinational corporations, but they heavily rely on their home state for uh, all kinds of support, uh, financial, uh, 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 cost and risk provision, uh, military support, and so on and so forth. So this whole kind of thing has to be slowly unraveled, and, and I don't think there's any formula for it. It's really going to have to be done by people themselves uh, coming to terms with this, you know, this you know, destructive residue of history. I mean, take the United States. Take, take the U.S.-Mexico boundary. Okay, well, what's that? You know, I mean. Uh, half of Mexico was conquered by the United States, okay? Now it's called the United States. The Mexican-U.S. border was, like most borders, was a result of conquest. It wasn't a natural border. Uh, it was a very porous border. So people of the same, you know, similar people lived on both sides, and they tended to move up and back. In 1994, something interesting happened. In 1994, NAFTA was passed with a lot of rhetoric about how we're unifying, you know, North America and so on and so forth. Uh, also in 1994, Clinton, who was no fool, militarized the border for the first time. Operation Gatekeeper militarized the border to make sure that people wouldn't move up and back. Capital, yeah, uh, but not people. Uh, so we got to stop this free movement of people up and back across a rather porous border uh, and impose a, a border that's semi-porous. Capital goes up and back easily, uh, but not people, because these systems are not designed for people. They're divine, designed for capital. And since then, you get, you know, hundreds of people being killed on the border and so on and so forth. Well, you know, that border shouldn't be there, uh, just like other borders shouldn't. But those are things that are going to have to be changed internally through understanding and, you know, social evolution of it and uh, social change. I don't think they can be imposed from the outside. Professor Noam Chomsky, it's been fascinating. Thanks so much. Noam Chomsky is a professor of linguistics and philosophy at MIT. Hegemony or survival America's Quest for Global Dominance is published by Metropolitan Books, an imprint of Henry Holt & Company. Visit hholt.com for more information. Book TV on C-SPAN 2 is brought to you every weekend as a public service of cable television. Coming up at 1.45 p.m. Eastern, Daniel Pipes on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and possible solutions. Then, images of African Americans at the turn of the 20th century, a small nation of people. Tonight on Book TV, Encore Book Notes with Hugh Price, author of Achievement Matters. 
After that, on Public Lives, a look at Austrian economist F.A. Hayek. And at 9.15 p.m. Eastern, another chance to see MIT linguistics professor Noam Chomsky. Two volumes thick and 2,300 pages long, Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language, published in 1755, marked a 